everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Thank you to everybody who came out and said hi and hung out with us at uh, Kamikaze yesterday. We had a great time with you. Also here, John Schnepp. Yeah, that's right. The Kamikaze's over. See you guys next year. It was a lot of fun, though, so thanks for coming by. Also here, Mark Ellis. Kamikaze was great. The first interaction I had with Schnepp was on Thursday. It was on Saturday, and I ran uh -huh, into you, and the first uh -huh. thing you showed me is a picture of you and Grumpy Cat. So uh -huh. a grown man <laughs> bragging about getting a picture with a kitty but, was the takeaway. Uh, and I was talking to a grown man dressed as Han Solo while I was showing him. So, so. Well, listen up, guys. Uh, as happens sometimes, a piece of news drops after we already have all the show notes uh, written out. And this is a fairly significant one. The first official trailer for the Warcraft movie has dropped, which you can see here. I kind of like that tagline, two worlds, one home. Uh, we get to see a human and the orc, of course, in there. And they have also announced, along with dropping the poster, that the first official trailer will drop on Friday. So just a few days away from now, we're going to get that first official Warcraft trailer. The poster's here. Mark, let's start with you. You've had a chance to take in the poster. What are you thinking, and how do you feel about the po the trailer drop? I have some nervous anticipation to see the trailer on Friday because I saw like like four minutes of footage of Warcraft at Comic Con in San Diego this past summer, and it it didn't wow me like I wanted it to. I wonder if they've cleaned any of the effects up for the trailer. I wonder how that looks. I wonder what the trailer will include. How much of the storyline it'll give us. This poster, just judging on the poster alone, I think is really cool because it's showing us that there's definitely two sides, and you're not really rooting. You're not really sure who you're rooting for because this poster doesn't tell you, hey, we're rooting for the humans to beat. Up all those orcs and all those other monsters it's like i don't know which side i'm picking this is this this feels more like a civil war situation to me than it does like good guys versus bad guys snap what about you yeah I was, i've got bloodlust when i saw the poster i just instantly started researching spells i was like death and decay son it's some crisp in you i had a lot of flashbacks of the old warcraft uh i can't wait actually you know i've seen all the armor they've had all these big displays at all the major comic cons for the last like six months so we've seen like what a lot of the characters look like. And it it's kind of exciting. And to know that Duncan Jones is involved and he's heading it up, that's why I have faith in the project. Yeah, the footage I've seen so far hasn't like 100% wowed me, but I'm looking forward to the overall piece, the entire film. So can't wait to see the trailer. I, I really, first of all, I really like the poster. I think the poster is yeah. really cool. I love, I love, like I said, that tagline, two worlds, one home. That's really cool. They do, we've seen the split face right. um, thing, but this is an appropriate usage of it. I. I think the orc face looks a little too human, other than the gnarly teeth. Right. Um, but that's besides the point. I, I do like the poster. I like the symbolism of it and all that kind of stuff. I like the color use. I like that you got the blue and the red. You've got the tr traditionals, man. I remember when I saw that poster, I instantly thought about Warcraft 1, the first Warcraft, mm -hmm. and using my peons and all that kind of stuff. It just took me right there. Now, let's also keep in mind, when that footage came, at Comic-Con, a lot of people said, hey, there's something wrong with the look of it. Mm -hmm. When they saw it at Comic-Con, the movie was still a full year away. Right. Like a year away. And even when it drops on Friday, this movie is still seven months away. It's still a long ways off. So I have a feeling that a lot of stuff has been touched up because four months have passed since that Comic-Con trailer, uh, that Comic-Con footage they showed us. So I, I've got a feeling we're gonna see something really spectacular i my hopes i'm probably setting myself up for big disappointment but my hopes are really high right now for this warcraft project i love the poster so friday <laughs> friday friday that's it we're gonna see like look and i've been saying for a long time too all video game movies in history have sucked even the ones i love like mortal kombat um it's a great we, oscar winning film john <laughs> love that movie. um i mean but warcraft and assassin's creed are are like they're the two movies holding out this golden apple of hope that we hope to grasp and bite deliciously into its flesh. Like, I mean, I, and if, so I've been so excited for these two movies that if one of them is bad, I'm gonna be so distraught. I just, I'm, I'm so interested to see the Warcraft game numbers after this trailer drops on Friday. Like, does it, is the trailer gonna set the internet on fire and everybody's gonna like remember, oh, I used to play Warcraft and love it. I wanna see what the Warcraft numbers are like this weekend after the trailer drops. Right. That might be a good indication as to how people feel Without about it. Without a word of a lie, when the trailer dropped, I instantly went to check to see if my, uh, if my account on uh, Blizzard's uh, Blizzard Net was still good or not, on Battle.net was still good because I'm thinking about starting up again. <laughs> I'm right. thinking about starting up just right. from seeing the poster. 
So there goes all my time. Okay, <laughs> let's get on with our first official topic of the day. It's Monday, which means it's time for our weekly box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one for the fourth time is the Matt Damon film, The Martian. The film brought in another $11.4 million to bring its five-week total up to $428 million worldwide. Still holding on to the number two spot is the Jack Black film, Goosebumps, which took in $10.2 million to bring its worldwide numbers up to $66 million. Holding on to the number three spot is the Tom Hanks film, Bridge of Spies, bringing in another $8 million. Climbing up from its fifth place finish last week is Hotel Transylvania 2 taking the number four spot with $5.8 million. And rounding out the top five is the new Bradley Cooper film, Burnt. The new film brought in just over $5 million in its opening weekend. John, what stands out to you about this week's box office report? Well, I mean, a couple things stand out. The Martian, once again, number one. Uh, a couple of, I think Dennis and I both predicted it would still be number one, and we both predicted uh, Goosebumps would still be number two. I, I think my top five fell apart uh, after that. So, once again, The Martian only dropping like 27% again, and going from its fourth into its fifth week. Impressive numbers. Goosebumps only dropping 34%. Bridge of Spies only dropping like 28%. But for the second week in a row, we have a brand new batch of brand new movies that have bombed. Mm -hmm. uh, Burnt, now I know they weren't expecting huge numbers out of Burnt, but $5 million for a Bradley Cooper, or a Bradley Cooper starring film after what they got with the, uh, the uh, American Sniper, mm -hmm. you know they were hoping for much better than that. Uh, Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse made $1.7 million. It opened on 1,000 less screens than Gem, Gem and the Holograms, and it still made more money. Uh, so there's that. But speaking of Gem and the Holograms, here is <laughs> here is the thing that really stood out to me, okay? First of all, talking about last week's failures, Rock the Casbah and Gem and the Holograms. In just its second week of release with Bruce Willis, Bill Murray, uh, some big, big names... Rock the Casbah, which is still in over 2,000 theaters in its second week, dropped 76% to make $353,000. Gem and the Hologram, still playing on over 2,400 screens, dropped 78% to make $290,000. Gem mm. and the Holograms has made a grand total in two weeks in wide release of $1.9 million. Both Rock the Casbah and Gem and the Holograms dropped more than Fifty Shades of Grey did. Because everybody was talking, that was the big story. Fifty Shades of Grey dropped 70%. What a disaster. And it is. That's a terrible number. So a lot of futility here, I believe. I have to double check my facts. But I think this weekend, and not a lot of people are surprised. I think some people are expecting this. But this weekend was the lowest box office weekend in 2015 so far. Got a feeling that's going to change when a little film called Spectre opens up next weekend. Right. But uh, those are the things that stand out to me. Mark, what about you? Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed going out trick-or-treating and not going to the movies, which actually helped make The Martian stay at number one, which is awesome because The Martian has been at number one for four weeks. Not four weeks in a row because it's actually been out for five weeks. It yeah. got bumped from the top spot, I believe, by Goosebumps. For one week. And yep. then it came right back, and it deservedly so is the number one movie again. What stands out to me is that Paranormal Activity, it really hurt itself by coming out on VOD the same time that it was released in theaters. <laughs> yes, it and did. A lot of fans pointed that out to me because because I thought it would do a lot better than it did. It was only playing on like 1,500 screens, and I think that with a name as big as Paranormal Activity, it would have done a lot better in theaters if they had just kept it as a theatrical release, then done VOD later. Something like Gemini the Holograms, Rock the Casbah, the advertising was terrible. And with Burnt, it wasn't a horribly marketed movie. It just wasn't as widely marketed as I thought I might see it. I thought I might see more ads for Burnt all over the place on TV. A star like Bradley Cooper, or even a star like Tom Hanks, who's in Bridge of Spies, you can't open a movie just on star power anymore. It's very rare to see a movie open with the lead person on the poster, and that's why you go see the movie. Something like The Martian, which was sold as a great story that happens to have a great cast, is the way you sell a movie these days. Shep, what's it to you? Uh, the failures of all these other films. It's like, <laughs> it feels like, aren't we doing the box office from three weeks ago? These are the same films, literally, with well, just one Martian, other film. Well, The Martian, Goosebumps, and Bridge of Spies yeah. have been one, two, and three for yeah. like two or three weeks. Yeah, now. so it feels, I feel really bad for all that. It seems like October is where you go to dump the films. You're like, well, I don't know if we're ever going to make money. Throw it out around Halloween. It doesn't matter. All right. I, you're right. The, the VOD versus film release day and date release date. 
it's going to start having a big effect on smaller films. I don't see it as having a big effect on larger films, especially event films, because those probably aren't going to do day and date release because those are the films that you're going to go out and see in the theater. But, uh, you know, but I would go see Bone Tomahawk if you haven't seen that. That's a fantastic film. Um, I'm a little bit surprised going to the ones that actually opened this. We talked a little bit about the failures of the films that opened last weekend. Um, Burnt was three wide release films opening this week and it came in fifth. I, I saw a little disappointed that. We mentioned Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse came in 12th place with 1.7 million. I really thought it would do better than that, especially considering it was Halloween weekend. Right. I think the marketing's been really good, um, and I thought the film deserved uh, a little bit better. than. I mean, we knew it wasn't gonna make 10 million or 15 million or anything like that, but I thought seven was was reasonable for it, and, and it didn't get there. The one I'm really surprised by, though, is the new Sandra Bullock, uh, uh, Billy Bob Thornton film, Our Brand is Crisis, coming in eighth place on its opening weekend, making 3.4 million on over 2,000 screens. Um, I expected much better than that. I expected much better than that. I thought it was gonna be in the top five. Uh, I didn't have it in my number one or number two positions or anything like that, but I thought it would do better than three. I'll tell you why. It's a horrible poster. It might be the worst poster I've ever yeah. seen. Bad Sandra Bullock just throwing her hands like this Billy Bob Thornton creepily leering at yeah. her. It's one of the worst posters I've ever seen. It tells you nothing about what the hell the movie is. I didn't hate the movie. I actually liked our brand as Crisis, but again, marketing a movie, that's everything these days. And Halloween weekend is, be if, it, if Halloween is on a weekend, it's like the Super Bowl weekend, where you can almost just scratch a day off of your box office receipts because nobody's going to the movies on Saturday night because everybody's out at a party or trick-or-treating that's true and i didn't even think our brand is crisis opened yet i mean that's i mean it was like sort of the the trailers made me so disinterested in seeing the film that i didn't even realize it opened see so. and i'm a little bit different because i actually like the trailers quite a bit but this is one of those situations where the trailer i didn't see the first trailer until three weeks before release now i often talk about people start freaking out it's seven months till the movie comes out and we right. haven't seen a trailer should we be worried relax it's seven months but I mean, John Wick was one month out and that worked. I didn't see this one until about three weeks out. Maybe maybe like three weeks, four weeks is a little too last minute to put him out. But it, then again, it's about how much they want to spend on the marketing campaign, I suppose. All right, what's next? We've known for some time that there would be a World War Z2 film heading our way, but not much movement has been seen on the project, tentatively set for a release date of June 9, 2017. According to a report in The Hollywood Reporter, things are now falling into place, with Dennis Kelly, creator of the British series Utopia, being brought on board to write a new draft of the script for World War Z2. It's also being confirmed now that J.A. Bayona will remain on board as director for the film. The confirmation comes on the heels of reports that Bayona was being courted by Universal to direct their own sequel, Jurassic World 2. The report says that Bayona was unlikely to leave the Paramount project since he had already had a deal in hand, but it sounds like the interest from a rival studio may have helped to spark progress on the sequel. Schnapp, your thoughts on World War Z 2 looking like it may be on track to hit its 2017 release date. I think it will, barring the, you know, remember the World War Z, the first one had like, they reshot the whole film. Yeah, they had the much, film completely yeah. done and then rewrote it and reshot the entire movie. Or at pretty, least three quarters of yeah, it. At yeah, at least practically a yeah. totally different film. Yeah, so I mean, I don't think they're going to do that again. I think they're going to uh, approach it smart this time. I'm sure Brad Pitt will be returning. And I it felt like World War Z ended with like kind of a... Wasn't there like a, well, I don't know, I can't remember now. Was there a cure? I know they were off on an island somewhere. Well, it's best you don't remember it, then you can't spoil the film for people <laughs> who haven't seen it yet. Well, you're right. Guys, I don't remember what happened, but if they did cure it, I guess it's back. More zombies. <laughs> I think this is great news, and I hope it does come out in 2017. I think it will, barring a huge star schedule in Brad Pitt, but he has a lot invested in this movie. I think he was a producer on World War yep. Z. Like, he really wanted this project to get off the ground, and it ended up being pretty successful. It wasn't like a huge hit domestically, given what its production cost was. This movie cost a ton of money to make, but I think it did like $200 million domestically, and then it crushed overseas. Yeah. So it makes sense that they would want to make another one, and I'm all for it. Look, kids, in today's landscape, it's not a matter of do you want to see zombies. It's do you want to see the right zombie project, and World War Z was a fascinating take on zombies. Even though you could definitely tell that they did some reshooting towards the end, I like how the first two thirds of the film felt like a really action horror film, and the last one was just a pure like suspense thriller kind of vibe. So I'm all on board for another World War Z. Yeah, I, I, I'm one of those guys where World War Z, it's it was kind of like Jane Got a Gun. It was all these production nightmares. Sure. They ended up hating what the final film was. They booted the director. They reshot almost the whole thing. It's like Matthew Fox was like a significant character in it, and then you just see him for a second <laughs> yeah. in the actual movie. By the Right, time it actually right. came out, you see him for a minute. It's like, wait a minute, was that Matthew Fox? And they pretty much cut that whole thing out. And, and I read about what 
his story arc and it was, and it was good that they took it out. Streamlined the movie quite a bit, and I ended up really enjoying World War Z. It wasn't mm -hmm. in my top five favorite films of the year or anything like that, but I quite enjoy, quite enjoyed it. Boyana, though, um, as a director, he's got another film coming out in 2016 called A Monster Calls, which sounds fascinating. It's got Liam Neeson, Felicity Jones, Sigourney Weaver, and it's about a young boy. It sounds a little bit like, um, oh, what was that, the, the best uh, Guillermo del Toro film? Uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's, it sounds a little Pan's Labyrinth to me. It's about a young boy who goes and starts talking to a tree monster in, to help deal with the fact that his single mom is facing a, a, a fatal illness. Wow. And it sounds fascinating to me. Now I find out this is the same guy directing the next you know, World War Z. Sign me up. I think this sounds really fascinating. I'm on board. I want less fatal illness and more tree monster. Like in that movie, <laughs> I want like 30%, 70%. That sounds great. And if a guy's doing a project like that, he sounds like the right person to bring on board for this sequel. And as far as like the studio putting pressure on him, like them, them making sure they had him for a movie, I don't know if I'd buy all of that because he's not like an A-list director that, oh, we need you on this project, but he sounds like he might be the right guy to make this movie good. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's ground them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? The final trailer for the upcoming Ron Howard, Chris Hemsworth film, In the Heart of the Sea, has hit the web. Set in the winter of 1820, In the Heart of the Sea follows the New England whaling ship Essex as it is assaulted by something no one could believe, a whale of mammoth size and will, an almost human sense of vengeance. The real-life maritime disaster would inspire Melville's Moby Dick, but that told only half of the story. In the Heart of the Sea reveals the encounter's harrowing aftermath as the ship's surviving crew is pushed to their limits and forced to do the unthinkable to stay alive. The film opens on December 11th. Mark Byers saw this new trailer for In the Heart of the Sea. I am so buying everything I'm seeing for this movie. I cannot wait to see this picture. It looks like they made the right move by indicated by this trailer that they moved it from earlier in the year to come out around Oscar time because this thing could be a contender for awards. But more so than that, it looks like such an entertaining film. And it appears that Brendan Gleeson is old Chris Hemsworth from the trailer. Like it's an old dude telling the story of when he was young. So it's the second trailer in like two weeks we've gotten when you have an old guy saying all the legends, they're true. This is one of the best legends of all time. I can't wait to see this come to life. It looks like we got the right team on board. I expected to see Han Solo go, it's true. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> but uh, I love the trailer. This looks like it's going to be one of these movies and I, we might have mentioned this before that has it all. Amazing story, great mythology, terrific performances, but also the big spectacle of great action and visual effects, wonderment and awe, all rolled into one package. And it's being brought to us by the same director who gave us Backdraft, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen Backdraft, freaking watch Backdraft. That movie's amazing. Um, Brendan Gleeson was, this is our first glimpse at him. This trailer mm -hmm. gave us a first glimpse of Brendan Gleeson, uh, who is indeed playing the older... Uh, Chris Hemsworth, so I guess Hemsworth doesn't die, spoiler, um, in the film. But Brendan Gleeson is one of these actors, dude, that a lot of times you mention the name and people won't know who you're talking about. Show them a picture. It's like, oh, yeah, I've seen him in like a million things. And he always, always brings it, like completely. If he's in a project as a character actor, supporting character, I'll go right. I think he's the best character actor in the business today. I will watch him in anything, play any kind of role. He can play a frail old man, but then you go into something like Troy and you can totally buy him as this huge warrior king who will kill you with his bare hands. He can do it all. I love this guy and this trailer does not disappoint. For me, it's a big buy. Yeah, I buy it. I I don't buy that he's playing uh, Hemsworth, the young, the older Hemsworth. Their accents, their voice, everything about the way they even talk sounds completely different. They're, basically butted him right next to another dialogue scene with with Hemsworth and it sounded like two completely different people so See, maybe it's I, his younger friend or something I don't know if it's the same character you know it's not all right I'm looking it up it is there we not go. it's I not knew I was everybody right. strike what I said from the record he is actually <laughs> playing the young Thomas Nickerson Chris Hemsworth character is Owen Chase uh, he's right. playing the old Thomas Nickerson the young Thomas Nickerson is being played by Tom Holland All right, there so, we go there so we go the new Spider-Man so, Spider so that makes okay, sense yes. because they just don't good even have call, the same accent catch. there's no uh, so. the way that trailer put it together though because you see Brendan Gleeson and then the next scene you see Thor and he so kind of looked like an old Chris and I was Hemsworth. like okay maybe somebody ate the yeah. Bowflex along the way but yeah. like <laughs> Thor it, they, they kind of, I did get the resemblance right. but now that we don't need to worry about that this yeah. movie looks even that, better that was my only worry now that it's cleared up I cannot wait to see this so movie. maybe Chris Hemsworth does die in the movie oh. but Tom Holland doesn't spoiler uh, 
such a fantastic story, Moby Dick, and then now we're going even earlier before, like the actually the origin of Moby Dick with Melville in there, like he, hearing the story, like the what inspired it. Uh, it's such a tragic thing too. I, uh, I I always get bummed out when I hear about whale uh, hunting and the harpooning and stuff like that. So it feels like this movie's going to show both sides of it, where it's like the pure terror of being attacked by a giant sea monster and also the horror of whaling itself. So. I, it, every, it has everything in it for me. I cannot wait to see and it. And they're not backing down with the advertisement. I mean, like like we've all said, it not only looks like it could win awards, it looks like a great adventure. It looks like a great film for even families to go see around Christmas yeah. time. It's not backing down to the mantle of Star Wars. It's like, no, we have a great picture we're selling here. I like that we got three trailers this early. And if you've been to a movie theater recently, the poster for In the Heart of the Sea looks amazing with the yes. boat and the oh, whale. You can see so the whale underwater. Good. This movie's going to be sweet. <laughs> and here, you know, we're talking about red flags. The other big green flag, let's not forget about this. This movie was supposed to open like 10 months ago. Right. You know, we had Ron Howard did a re recorded a little movie talk message to put on before movie talk one time. It was opening next week. Only that didn't quite happen. A lot of times we get worried about these red flags of studios moving their movies into like, you know, waste grounds for movie releases. What did these guys do? They got the heart of the sea and they say, you know what, F this, this thing can win awards. And they took it and they moved it into December, right into the heart of the Oscar race. Mm. Big green flag for me. Right. So I think we could be looking forward to something really, really special. All right, what's next? Although the new James Bond film Spectre doesn't open in North American cinemas until later this week, the film has already opened in many international markets and is being breaking box office records wherever it goes, especially in the UK. According to reports in the UK, the film has opened to an estimated 63.8 million in its first seven days of release, securing new records for the biggest opening of all time in UK box office history. Schnapp, knowing that Spectre is breaking records around the world, buyers that it will beat the opening weekend total that Skyfall made in North America, which was 88 million. Boy, you know, uh, depending on what a lot of the critics say over the next week, if the, all the critics here in America are like, I cannot believe it, it totally, it's on par with Skyfall, go see the new Bond movie, or if people start saying it's like Quantum of Solace, it's Solace, it's like, yeah. So if, it, if people start bumming on it, I don't think it'll break the 88 million. It'll still be a big hit. It'll break 50 million easily, probably 65 million. But if everybody's loving on it and say, you've got to see it, then I think it'll probably go 90, 100 million. I buy that it'll break, uh, break the record because at this point we're hearing decent things about it coming out. And people are really looking forward to this film, mostly because like you were saying, uh, Skyfall. Everybody yeah. loves Skyfall so much. They've been dying for this new one. On top of all of that, we've had a couple of weeks in a row that didn't have any new movies that people were dying to run out and see. I think a lot of people are looking forward to going to the movies, and yeah. I think Spectre's gonna be the one they go. I think it's gonna crack 100 million, not, nice. not by much. But I think it's going to crack 100 million. So I do buy it'll beat uh, it'll beat Skyfall. I buy that those are 100 million dollar packs. Look at those things. I mean, <laughs> that guy's a 48 year old man. Look at the chest he's got. You know how jiggly I'm going to be by the time I'm 48 years old right here. I don't buy it's going to break the record though. I don't think it's going to hit 88 million. And I'll tell you why. It might sound ridiculous, but there's another movie coming out this weekend that a lot of people are excited about from multi generations, and it's the Peanuts movie. Good and I'm point. telling you, Good I know point. I know you look at Peanuts and Bond, and they're two totally different movies. But I think that there's going to be a lot of people going to see Peanuts this weekend. I think Spectre will win the overall box office. I think it's going to defeat Charlie Brown and Snoopy. I don't think it's going to be by that much. So I think Spectre is going to settle around a very respectable 65, 60 million dollar range. Say Peanuts again. Peanuts. Okay, because the way you said that, a lot of people were peanuts. going out to see Peanuts this weekend. A lot of people. I hope a lot of see people penis. do see Peanuts I this think weekend. Spectre will be beating Penis, but by just a little bit. I'm talking about packs. You know what I'm oh talking about. Gosh. I mean, come on. I'm just curious. Is the name of your right hand Spectre? It, it, Never mind it, it, that. What? Hey, Never John, mind wait that. a second. Touche. Touche. Edit that out. My left hand is named out. Octopussy. <laughs> All right, what's next? Oh my gosh, one of the biggest <laughs> questions comic book movie fans have been asking is when we're going to get a new standalone Hulk film. The character was one of the fan favorites in the original Avengers movie. Fans were thrilled to hear he'll be appearing in the upcoming Thor Ragnarok, but still no word of a standalone film. In a recent interview with USA Today, actor Mark Ruffalo was asked if we're any closer to a Hulk movie, to which he said the following. Actually, it feels even further away. It's not Marvel's property, it's Universal's property. I don't know. 
it seems really problematic. I'd love to do it. It'd be really fun. There's a lot still to do with the character. I always try to think about different places we could go with him. When you get off the planet Earth, you can start playing with that stuff a little bit. John, in light of Ruffalo's comments about Universal, buy or sell that we'll ever see another Hulk standalone movie. Well, what we first got to do is is clear something up here. The Hulk does not belong to Universal. The rights to you to the Hulk went back to Marvel back in 2006. Marvel has the exclusive, all-empowering production rights of the Hulk. The Hulk is their character. However, what Ruffalo is actually referring to is that Universal still has the distribution rights to the Hulk. So if Marvel wants to go out and make a Hulk movie, they can, but they can't distribute it. Disney can't distribute it. It's going to be distributed by, by Universal, and there's a lot of money to be made in distribution. Now, that being said... In the past, Marvel has made films when other studios or distribution companies still had the rights. Like, I believe, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, uh, Cap, the first Captain America and I believe the first Thor might have been distributed by Paramount uh -huh. uh, until those deals lapsed. So it's not like they can't do it if they want to. They, they can go ahead and do it and let Universal distribute. I think the real issue here isn't that Universal has the distribution rights to Hulk. I still think the issue is what Kevin Feige talked about at the Phase 3 announcement thing at El Capitan last year. Hulk's a tricky character to give him his own movie. Because, look, the Hulk is a global threat. Captain America's great, but he ain't going to destroy the world. Um, Iron Man is great, but, you know, the United States can take him down. The Hulk is a huge problem. And so then you're faced with this issue, who fights the Hulk? It's a lot like a Superman thing is who fights Superman, except you can actually have Superman have dialogue. Um, so he's a tricky thing. And so Kevin Feige was talking about how he's going to have a huge presence in all the movies. It's tough. That being said, people love this new Hulk way too much. I think at some point we are going to see it. And maybe taking him off Earth puts him in an environment where he isn't all powerful and can just crush anything you throw at him. And it makes storytelling more interesting. Ruffalo is pointing out too, there's some great potential storytelling about Ruffalo versus the Hulk. About the Hulk, his the Hulk's thing that drives him most crazy is Banner. And that inner conflict, you could tell some great stories there potentially. So I believe it's going to happen. I buy it. What about you, Mark? Yeah, well, I do buy Mark Ruffalo <laughs> appearing in Zoolander 2 based on the blue steel look that he's giving us in that picture. <laughs> I also buy that eventually you are going to have another standalone Hulk movie. Look, the Incredible Hulk, the one with Edward Norton, did as good of a job as I think you could possibly do telling that story with the constraints that the Hulk character has. I've always thought, and I think a lot of people agree with this, that the Hulk works best as a character in a bigger film. If you're a Agreed, basketball yeah. fan, he's like Reggie Miller or Ray Allen. He can, he can just knock down threes from the corner all night long. Can't necessarily create his own shot, though. I mean, the Hulk does have some limitations if you're trying to tell an entire movie just based around him. Having said that, if he has a large presence in Thor Ragnarok, what does Marvel do a great job of? They listen to the fans. So if the fans are clamoring for a new Hulk movie, a lot like they were after the first Avengers film, and everybody said, oh, why don't we get our own Hulk movie? If they love him in Thor Ragnarok as much as they loved him in the first Avengers, you're definitely going to see a Hulk standalone movie some point. Schnapp. Yeah, I, I specifically like the way what Ruffalo's mm. like hinting at is like, Getting Hulk off Earth means we are going to get a Hulk movie, but I don't think it's going to be called the Hulk or Planet Hulk. I think what they're going to do is wrap him. And that's what also Feige kept saying is like Hulk is part of our, our universe and he works well with all the other characters. That's why he's in Thor Ragnarok. That's probably why like after Infinity Wars one and two, he'll still probably be off Earth is my guess. And they'll do some kind of spin off with him and some of the other cosmic style characters because that's a good compliment to those kind of characters. You, you, you need some help with this planet. Here's the Hulk. You know, it's like I, I don't see them doing an incredible Hulk standalone movie for at least, you know, eight, nine years. And if they do that, will Ruffalo still be around wanting to be that character banner in eight or nine years? If I was Ruffalo, probably sure. Why not? You know, but I don't see them doing it anytime soon. I mean, Marvel has a bunch of untitled projects still that are like going to be taking place around 2020, 2021. And again, depending on what happens, I mean, we still have to survive Infinity War Part right. 1 and 2. Like, yeah. let's not forget, there's like four hours of war that the Hulk has to survive in those right. two movies just to be able to be in a standalone movie. But again, if the fans love him in these three movies or these four movies that he's going to be appearing in coming up mm -hmm. i think you'll see it sooner let than me later. ask you a question let me play a little bit of devil's advocate here because I, I i agree with you but let me throw this out there if that does happen ragnarok comes out and the hulk uh, figuratively speaking crushes it and the fans <laughs> love him in that could that then go the other way and have marvel go say he, see he works great as 
being in other characters' movies. He works wonderful and the fans loved him. We can keep him there. Do you think it could possibly go that way instead? I don't think so because they've already proven that point. And I think <laughs> that, again, like, like money talks too. You can make a lot of money if you have people that really want to see a Hulk movie. Maybe to the point where they would do what happened with Ant-Man and the Wasp, where they right. get so excited about a Hulk movie, we need to put this storyline in sooner than later. So they might move a project up. They might move a project back to put a Hulk movie out if he's that popular in Thor Ragnarok. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. This is how it works. If you have a topic or a question you'd like us to address on this show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com, and we'll pick a couple of questions out to address here on the show. But we are also doing this show live. We do this show live 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 2 o'clock in the afternoon New York time. Every day we do it live here at the, these times. And if you are one of the people who's watching us live right now, the last part of the show, we're just going to be taking your live Twitter questions. So if you got a question you'd like to see if we can get on the show, tweet us right now. First of all, follow us at Collider Video, and then tweet a question to us at Collider Video, and Ashley will pick out a few questions near the end of the show after we're done mailbag. With that being said, Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Christopher Hobbes writes, thanks for taking my question. I am in a dilemma. You guys and gals are great, and I enjoy listening to your insight every day. My question is simple. How do I find where limited release movies are playing? Trumbo and Spotlight are both on my most anticipated list this year, and I cannot find a theater that is playing either of them, and I am in a large market, Phoenix. Any help is appreciated. Yeah, that is the, the plight of the the hardcore film fan is sometimes yeah. there's a lot of these great movies that only get limited release and limited release is a very flexible term limited release could mean 700 screens limited release could also mean seven screens yeah. so it makes it really tough so even living in los angeles like we sometimes have a discussion like where the hell is this movie playing yeah. and we live in la what i would do is find the uh theater ch the biggest theater chain around that's in your area i don't know if amc's there or regal's there or cinemark whatever is close to you Go to their website and just search. They should have the ability to search not just your local theater, but search for a movie and see where it's playing. Barring that, if that does not work, then you know there are some other third-party sites, our friends over at Fandango or MovieTickets.com mm -hmm. or whatever. Just go to their site, search for the movie, and then search in your area, and it should tell you. The unfortunate reality is sometimes these limited release movies that are limited to 20 theaters or 30 right. theaters, you may not find them in a Phoenix or in a St. Louis or in a Kansas City or something like that, which is really unfortunate. I got a feeling, though. I don't know this for sure. I think you'll be able to find Trumbo somewhere. I, I think you will. So like I said, look for the major theater chain sites, search there. If that fails, go to something like Fandango or MovieTakes.com and search there, and you should be able to find something. Chef, what do you usually do when you're looking for one of those those little uh, if, smaller films that's just hard to find? Uh, my very first thing is I go to the Sundance Five. The I, I look at the art house theaters that are chains. So like I go to the bigger art house theater chains first, and then I go to the solo like the New Beverly or like you know or Cine Family here in L.A. And I, unfortunately, you got L.A., Chicago, and New York, and that's where a lot of those smaller films are gonna if they're opening in five theaters hmm. it's two in new york two in la and one in chicago so you're out of luck phoenix you got to take a long drive get on a plane you know so if you want to experience that kind of uh, cinematic thing throw that money down you know i mean otherwise you're, you know that's just how it is a smaller so, smaller movies just aren't playing in wide release anymore i like that marketing strategy the trumbo could make 10 million dollars opening weekend seven million in airline tickets that's to go right. see trumbo <laughs> in right. los angeles i feel your pain like i was trying to see the end of the tour and i live in los angeles and i couldn't find it anywhere i typed it into movie tickets in fandango and it was like there's no theaters in your area playing this movie the weekend it was coming out if you live in phoenix drive to tempe though because there's an amc theaters on like that main drag that's near asu and right across the street is a smaller independent theater and they might might be showing it first run movies there, mm -hmm. so check so it they, out. What's the name of that theater? Do you I know? have no idea. All right, but look <laughs> no it up idea. online and search there. Maybe you'll find uh, the, the movie you're looking for there. All right, what's next? Raymond B. Wong, he writes, will there be people who bought tickets to see the screening of Star Wars just to resell them at a higher price, just so some desperate <laughs> moviegoers can see it first, and will Disney be looking to make sure no scalping occurs? Normally, this would be called an idiotic question, but in this case, mm -hmm. we already know it's happening. It's already happening. I mentioned this before. I saw on Craigslist a dude with two tickets to the 7 p.m. showing at the uh, Chinese theater, which that's where you're going to go to a Star Wars premiere. That's where you go. That's where the original Star Wars opened, the whole bit. It's a totally different theater now, but still, it's the same place. It was selling two tickets for $2,500. For 25 Now, whether he got it or not, that's another issue. Ugh. But I have no doubt 
that you walk around the AMC Burbank 16 or the movie theater near you on Thursday, December 17th, when the first screens of that movie, you're going to see a couple guys stand in the corner. Tickets! Who needs tickets? Who needs tickets? And they're all <laughs> waving up a hand of tickets, selling to you for the reasonable price of $35 a piece or $45 a piece, mm -hmm. whatever. And it's insane because this isn't like the Super Bowl or a football game on any average football game on a Sunday where it's like, this game is the only game this year. This is the, the only time Pittsburgh's going to play Cleveland this year and they're playing here and blah, blah, blah. This is Star Wars, which will have eight more showtimes tomorrow, 20 more showtimes a day after that, and 20 more showtimes a day after that. But it's the one time that people are just like me, the idiots, would probably pay the premium to see it opening day in that first block of screenings. So I think you're going to see it happen around this country. Have you seen it or... What do you think about that story? Can you think of a movie uh, <laughs> right now that would actually make you plop down extra money to buy to pay an increased price to buy it off a of scalper to see it opening weekend? Can you think of one uh, that I would pay extra for? Actually, let's say double. Let's say double. So like a forty dollar ticket, and right. opening this weekend, he's like, no, I don't want to wait the two extra days. I want to see it tonight, and I would pay that. To I would see pay. This. I would pay that for like an event film like Star Wars or Batman v Superman. If they if they if I had no other choice, and they're like, sorry, I have everything else was locked out. No, all your friends don't have tickets for you. There's nothing available. There's only those two tickets, and they're forty bucks each. Take them now, or you'll you'll have to wait two extra days, and all the spoilers will come out. And you just have to be <laughs> sleep up to sleep all two days. I would I would pay that extra money. I would do that, but I would never, ever pay twenty seven hundred. I would not even pay a hundred and fifty dollars. I would sleep two days. I would be like, yeah, I'll, goodbye, goodnight. I'm not gonna lie. I'm, play, I'm playing games. I'm not gonna lie. I, I might consider hundred and fifty dollars for the premiere, not the first public screen, but I right. mean the premiere. I I would probably pay five hundred dollars. I would probably pay five hundred dollars to right, get the world premiere. Let's talk after premiere. the show, son. I got some tickets <laughs> for you. Hey, money yourself. is the least of my concerns. I'll pay whatever you want. Just make it just money. Don't make it anything else that I'm willing to do to go see Star Wars opening night. What you really have to do is, if somebody is trying to scalp you Star Wars tickets for the first showing opening night, is you have to look in your area as to when other Star Wars screenings are still available that week. And you can be like, oh, okay, it's all sold out Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I better get these hundred dollar tickets for Thursday night. I think that's worthwhile because it's going to be hard going on the line that week and if you haven't seen Star Wars yet you don't want to wait till Monday or Tuesday the next week so I would totally consider making that investment not $2,500 because if you can tell by the way I dress I ain't rich but I would probably pay a hundred hundred fifty to go to the premiere Maybe five hundred times. Oh, you guys! Yeah, cool. maybe the yeah. premiere Star Wars. The premiere dressed up. and like JJ's there. George is there. Yeah. Harrison's there. I, I mean, for a Star 500, Wars five hundred, that's not that bad. Right? Yeah, I could live with five hundred. Yeah. All right, folks. As I said, it's now time for us to go to you guys who are watching this show live and take your questions live via Twitter. You still might have time to sneak one in under the wire. Follow us on Twitter at Collider Video and tweet your questions to us there. Our gatekeeper is Ashley Mova. She's the one you got to kiss up to because she's the one who decides which one of your questions gets on. So, Ashley, what are people asking on Twitter now? Herman Falcao writes, funniest movie that is not a comedy. Oh, funniest movie that's not a comedy. Funniest movie is not a comedy. Um, I Okay, look, my, my go-to answer is a really bad movie that's unintentionally funny is Planet of the Dinosaurs. I say it every week. <laughs> You've got to check out Planet of the Dinosaurs. Um, Back to the Future isn't really a comedy, um, but it's there, there's some really oh, funny dude. moments in that. Oh, it's hilarious I've got, movie. I've got one. Leverage. Oh, Leverage. Battlefield Earth. Yeah, Battlefield <laughs> Earth, man. Yeah, it is it, so funny. It is. It depends on if you're asking, it's so awful that it's hilarious to laugh at, or if it's intentionally very funny. The it's problem, not intentionally funny. No, no, Battlefield <laughs> Earth is not intentionally <laughs> funny. And it brings up the problem, because a lot of times if a movie is very funny, it's often called an action slash comedy. Right, it's right, called, right. Or called a dramedy, or called a high slash comedy. So it's, I'd have to think, it's a great question, you guys in the chat board or in the comments section, either one, leave your thoughts. What do you think is a movie that was not at all advertised as comedy, as something else, but was really, really funny? Here's anyway. another classic one: The Room with Tommy Wiseau. Oh my god! Oh, Once I got again, it. So now awful, he's like, he's hilarious. now he's like, he, he's changed it to his tune to like it's always been supposed to be funny, be, like after people are throwing spoons and forks and all that stuff. So. I, I got a total franchise that is actually huh. it's a great all time awesome franchise, but it was never sold as a comedy, and that's particularly the first three Die Hard movies have a lot oh, of. Very in funny. them, but Very they're funny. not marketed as comedies at all. But right. John McClane's hilarious. 
This weekend I was watching um, American Psycho and I found myself mm. laughing a Good lot one. in the yeah. movie. That one time Christian Bale's like listening to Huey Lewis in the news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my God, that Ooh. scene is hilarious. All right, what's next? Thomas Purdy writes, do all films make cast and crew sign a non-disclosure agreement or is it just big movies? What happens if someone breaks it? Um, I'd be shocked if anybody was stupid enough to not make cast and crew sign non-disclosures. I mean, because this is just too, there's too much money. In fact, even in smaller movies, like, oh, that movie only costs $5 million to make. That's five, there's more money I'll ever see in my lifetime. That's $5 million. Um, so I think they'd be idiots not to put it in there. If you violate it, you sub, you subject yourself to being sued into oblivion. I mean, right. and rightly so. I mean, if if somebody trusts you and says, yeah, you come and work on this movie and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, don't you can't reveal anything. You can't share stuff with people. And if you do, we're, we're going to, like I said, sue you into oblivion. And then they do it. And they deserve to be sued into right. oblivion. So um, I can't think of a project that wouldn't make a non-disclosure. Shnep, have you ever worked on a project where there either weren't non-disclosures or you didn't make other people sign non-disclosures? Nope. I always make people sign non-disclosures on any of my stuff that I work on. And I've signed non-disclosures on almost every single project I've worked on. Unless it was like the only ones I haven't done or if I was just doing a, what I do like here. Like I'm talking on a show. I didn't have to sign a non-disclosure. No, no, I make you like, sign a non-disclosure agreement every I, morning when I sign a show I do. Notes. I do have to sign every time, which can't be is such a tough guy. But uh, <laughs> no, I mean like when you're just talking, you know, off the cuff kind of stuff like in news interviews and stuff or interviews like that. But it, within even within the interview stuff, when you're doing a documentary, I had everyone sign a non-disclosure because it was all about stuff that we didn't want to reveal until the film came out. So there were certain things you know, that I discovered through making that you know documentary that I didn't want just, hey, just talk about it. I was like, can you just not talk about it until the film comes out and just sign this so that it's all cool? You know, I think it'll happen eventually where, I don't know of a story of this yet, but if an actor or an actress actually did talk about something they weren't supposed to and the studio actually sued them. I mean, we've seen people get slapped on the wrist for like admitting too much at Comic-Con about a character or something like that, but with all these Star Wars movies that are coming out, with all the Marvel and DC movies that are coming out, NDAs are such a huge priority with the way that people communicate through social media today so eventually somebody might actually get sued or lose money for yapping too much about a project i just don't think it's happened to this point do you remember when that ridiculous stupid story came out that jenna malone was playing carrie kelly mm -hmm. in batman v superman yeah yes. it was because some random local news crew said we just talked to one of the crew members who let us know that jenna malone is playing uh, uh the redhead carrie kelly and everybody ran with it and one of the things i said is that that's clearly not true because any crew member working on one of these movies will know well enough that you cannot say that to anybody and then sure enough it turned out not to be true all right what's next adam mcroy writes honestly what's the percentages we lose one of the classic characters in star wars the force awakens uh, uh, so by classic characters let's just say that doesn't include 3po or r2d2 they're droids which means they're expendable they're not <laughs> dying john that's what that means um we're t probably talking about luke han and leia I think 20%. I honestly, I, I know some people will say like 90, 95. I honestly, I honestly think they're all surviving into the next one, but I'm not gonna say completely rule it out. I'm gonna say 20%. I'll throw Chewie in there too as a classic sure, character. Yeah. So Chewie, Han, Luke, and Leia. Oh, he buys it. He buys it for sure. Chewie is not dying in episode know. seven or eight or nine. For episode seven, 100%, nobody's dying. I'm gonna That's put it. I'll put it, at, I'll put it at seventy percent. I think I, one of them's gonna kick it, but in a heroic way, just like uh, you know, you had Obi Wan sacrifice himself. Oh, That's it's gonna, so hard. I know, but you know that brings that extra element of drama. You know? Can't they just wait till Episode Eight to kill everybody uh -huh. off? <laughs> well, speaking of that, hold on a second. Star Wars Episode. I'm putting this Are in we getting right tickets? Now. Are you buying us tickets right I'm now? I'm buying tickets <laughs> right Premier now. Tickets now for I saw a bunch of people <laughs> tweeting about this before, and I, I should address this. Okay, yeah, here it is. On IMDb, uh, if you go to Star Wars Episode Eight, mm -hmm. Harrison Ford is listed as yes. playing Han Solo in the movie. So, uh, so I have a lot of people tell me, "See, John, it's confirmed." Hot. Now, I don't think he's dying in Episode Seven. Just, just for the record, I don't think he's dying in Episode Seven. That being said, just because it says on IMDb that he's going to be in Episode Eight means squat jack shit. I mean, it means nothing at all. IMDb is awesome for looking at films that have already come out and you can pretty much book it if it says in IMDb for a movie that came out last year or last week even, all that information. But for future movies, it's a lot of it's speculative. 
just because Harrison Ford is listed on IMDb does not mean he's going to be in the movie. So don't go to the bank with that. If they kill Harrison Ford in episode seven, I want a refund for $1,000 for the tickets that I bought on eBay. <laughs> I, want a, I want an action figure of Harrison Ford dressed up as a hot dog. <laughs> that was great. That was awesome. Yeah. And he that was, was like really great. pouring out his soul when he's talking, I, I think the movie's amazing, saying this dressed as a hot dog. <laughs> it's fantastic. All right, let's take a few more. All right, Michael writes, if you had to pick one horse icon slash slasher to ask Act as your bodyguard during the end of the world. Who would you choose and why? Jason. He's unstoppable. He's just unstoppable. So I would have to, if I need my, my bodyguard to embody that, I'm going with Jason. I, can, I, I might go with Michael Myers because both of those guys don't talk, so you wouldn't have to worry about like boring conversation. conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I might go with Michael Myers. You guys are so missing the boat on this. Okay, I wanted to go with Freddy Krueger because at least he keeps us all but laughing. Zombies, sure. don't yeah, they zombies don't dream. Zombies don't dream. I'm not taking Freddy Krueger, okay? You, right. took, you took a guy who went into space. I'm taking a guy who actually landed on the moon. That's the leprechaun, baby. The leprechaun <laughs> can get me off Earth, out of this post-apocalyptic waste, and get me to a new planet and help me survive. The leprechaun is my lucky charm. But he might just be taking you for that weird pot of gold, and you're like, dude, you're supposed to be protecting me. And he's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> he laughs at that's you. A risk. I'm going to wear green, so he's, he's not take, pinching He's going to take you back to the hood. <laughs> <laughs> See back to the hood, goes. too. All right, what's next? Kareem Yamut writes, what is the most overrated movie? I, I mean, we get Ooh. questions like this all the time. I, it, remember what overrated means. Overrated means... It's generally acknowledged as being awesome. So I, I hate it when I get in these conversations with people and say, well, what do you think is an overrated movie? And they say a movie that most people think is bad. It's like, no, no, no. You have to say something that everybody else loves. That has to be the prerequisite. And so for me, it's always been Blade Runner. It's the movie that is generally acknowledged by people much smarter than me, is a fantastic all-time science fiction classic. So, And it's one I don't necessarily appreciate. So. For me, I have to say the overrated one is uh, is Blade Runner. I will say, I always think when John Kempia says that, I don't think he saw Blade Runner. I'm like, you fell asleep. You didn't, you didn't, some you didn't see something. it all the way through. You're like eating popcorn and passed out. You didn't see the movie. Um, I don't know. We'll talk about this later. Did you see the whole I, movie? I did right. see the whole thing. Um, but uh, I want to see it with you again. Uh, you might have seen it when you were 13. That could be fun. That, we'll see it again. Um Frozen for me is the overrated and and but a lot of people give hate to that. A lot of people really? give hate. Yeah, I, I'm, but I'm not hating it. I'm not like ah, oh, it's garbage or this. I'm I'm happy that like it's a family film that everyone can sing along with. But when I saw it, it just didn't affect me in that way that everyone else was like, oh my god, it's the most fantastic film. I'll say this too for very current films, Inside Out. I feel is overrated. Everyone's talking about it. it's like the the top ten movies. I really liked it. But I didn't love it, and it's not. It wasn't one of those movies where I was like, "Oh my God, I can't wait to tell everyone to see Inside Out." And all you guys loved it, and everyone was talking about it so much. And when I finally saw it, I just wasn't. It wasn't that movie. That, that one had qualifies. That, that qualifies because yeah. I'm one of those guys. I have it in my top two. Yeah, yeah a movie that gets a lot of love that recently came out that I just I can't get into is Dread. I know everybody wants to see a sequel to Dread, and they think it's like the be the closest thing we've gotten to the raid in America. I I just don't get it. I'll try to watch it again, but all time I've said it before. Fantasia. Mickey dressed up as a wizard, <laughs> casting a spell of boredom on me for 90 minutes. No thanks. <laughs> All right, let's take three more. All right, Jake Silva writes, if you had one movie to make, do you cast Ryan Gosling or Chris Pratt? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, that's an, uh, like My first reaction is to say it depends on the kind of movie you want. If you're going more dramatic, you go Ryan Gosling. If you want action or comedy or adventure, you go Chris Pratt. But you didn't give me those options. So I will go... Gosling's a little more proven. He's been in a few more films and proved a little bit more over time. I'm a huge Pratt fan, but if I had to make that investment, I had to pick one of them, and I don't know if it's comedy, adventure, or drama, I'll go... Uh, because Gosling did um, a Drive. And right. so that was that was kind of... Like the, uh, Nicholas Wayne Revan said, yeah. that's kind of like the origin story of a superhero in many ways. So, so I'll see a little more... I haven't seen Pratt really flat out do a drama yet other than like a small role in Moneyball or something like that. So I'll go Gosling. I am going to bank on the fact that the movie I'm making is not a political movie that's hoping for an Oscar and say Chris Pratt is going to be my guy because he can do action, he can do comedy. When was the last time Ryan Gosling was actually funny? Like, the Crazy Super Love had funny moments he was, with him. I thought but, he was really funny in Crazy he Super Love. Was, he's, he's no Chris Pratt. He no. is no Chris no, Pratt. No, he's not. So I think Chris Pratt's a little more versatile, and I just I think Chris Pratt is a more likable on-screen presence, so... 
I would go with Pratt myself, if like because it could be any genre, so we don't know what it is. It's open ended. Uh, I think Pratt and Zero Dark, Dark Thirty was really great. You know, he was really um, good. In that. So, I get a small role, but you're yeah, right. He's small really good role, in that. but I think he's flexible enough in those in those all those areas. And so is Gosling. So it's a tough call, but I'm going to go with Pratt. When was the last time Gosling trained Raptors? <laughs> it's it's been a while. And it's, right. Maybe back in his Disney kit when he was one of the Musketeer <laughs> he days. Did. Right. Oh, you can't do that on television or whatever movie, whatever show he was on. Uh, but no, it's a no, no lose situation though. Either oh, yeah. one of those right. guys. No yeah. lose. I, I like Ryan Gosling. Yeah. He's just arguing for my boy. Yeah. All yeah. right. What's next? Supporting role goes to the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas Hernandez writes. Do you think we'll ever get a Donnie Darko sequel or remake? I love the original, but wouldn't mind a remake. Um, sequels and almost an impossibility because there are just so many people who have not seen the original right. in the first place. Remake though, talk to me in about three, four, five years. I think that's a definite possibility as a remake. Yeah, they already had a sequel. I, I think it was like Darko S or something. I saw it, uh, but and they, Donnie Darko then had the it had a re-release, like a revised, like the special edition Donnie Darko, which was also fun. You can see both of those. I think it's just good as a standalone film. Yeah, I mean, eventually it'll get remade, maybe in 10, 15 years. Yeah, I, I think it's not going to be before fifteen years. I just saw Donnie Darko for the first time last week. Me and the nonfiction girlfriend sat down and watched it because she's a huge fan of, it and I'd never seen it, and I just want to watch that movie again. Like, I don't want to see a reboot. Yeah. It's one of those rare movies where you can keep watching this same movie and get something more out of it every time. So let's not remake it just yet. Let's give it 15, 20 years. All right, last question of the day. Santez writes, yearly Star Wars movies, good or bad idea? Uh, it's, uh, let's put it this way. I love the blueprint they got out, an episode every year or every other year, and a, an anthology film on the off years. So I think it's a really, if you're going to do a new star, like if they had said, we're going to have episode seven this year, episode eight next year, episode nine the year after that, episode 10, I might go, but this whole idea of staggering them, episode anthology, episode anthology, I think it's a really nice move. We can't really definitively answer the question until we see Rogue One. And we've seen now two Star Wars movies two years in a row. How does it affect us? But I think it's going to work. So I'm going to lean towards the idea that it's a good idea for now. Schnepp, what do you think? Good idea, bad idea? I think it's a great idea. When they first announced it, I, I was excited because I was like, how is this even possible? I'm used to waiting like three years yeah. or 10 or 12 years between they do a trilogy and then you have to wait like an entire like generation of kids to you know be born and grow up and be 13 to see another trilogy. This way, you're, you're going to see one a year for how long? 12 years? That's 12 Star Wars movies. That's pretty exciting, so I'm all for it. Yeah, as of today, I love the idea. I'm not ready. Christian, the host of Jedi Council, keeps trying to sell me on doing two Star Wars movies a year, and I think that might be uh, that's a, bit much. a little excessive just from the fact that, and even with one a year, I want the time to enjoy the buildup. I know we all can't wait to see The Force Awakens, and part of the reason is because we've been waiting for so long. Yeah. I love the the tantric kind of excitement. Like, let's just keep... Uh, I, uh, I I don't want to see the episodes year after year after year. I want to, you know, wait for them. It doesn't have to be three years. It could be two years like what they're doing, but I, I don't want to see more than one a year as of right now. All right, well, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. Fan of some television shows? We've got, like, six shows that we do recap shows for here on Collider Video. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out the ones we right now we do. Supergirl, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Flash, Arrow, The Walking Dead, Star Wars, Rebels. Check those shows out. It would be great. And um, some of you might notice it's hard because I grow the facial hair of a four-year-old child. Um, <laughs> I'm sporting a little bit more than I normally do. It is November, which, uh, you know, I, I do this every year now, is to raise awareness for cancer and hopefully encourage you guys, remind you guys to donate to cancer research. It is No Shave November, or Movember as they call it. And so I will not be shaving uh, this scruff. <laughs> it can't make me look any less appealing. Um, I won't be shaving this for the rest of the month to kind of encourage you guys to donate to cancer research uh, uh, this year. I hope you keep that in mind. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp with his hand named Spectre. Schnepp, where can people find you online? <laughs> I'm going to say you're going to look exactly the same at I the end of, of exactly November. I probably look exactly the same in one month. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Just follow me at John Schnepp and you can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Get a digital download. Sitting over here on my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? John Campia, growing a mustache so I don't have to. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram, at 5150 Ellis. This weekend, I'll be in Austin, Texas at Cap City Comedy Club. Wednesday through Saturday, telling jokes, come out and say hi. And sitting on the end, of course, our lovely hoste, Miss Ashimova, who can 
you know, she's actually been participating in No Shave November for about six months now, and she still makes it look that good. Ashley, where can people find Don't you? Don't make me do a competition because I can probably grow a bigger mustache than you, sadly. You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter and also on Facebook just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.